Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Micah Sargent and I talk about how Apple is ending iTunes U. Also, Amazon is postponing its facial recognition relationship with police for a year. We'll see if that extends further in a year. Android 11 Beta 1 is released without Google's big event. We talk about some of the features there. And Brian Cooley from CNET joins us to talk about how convergence that led to smartphones almost didn't happen at all. It could have very easily not happened. We talk all about that next on Tech News Weekly. Tech News Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes enterprise-level security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 137, recorded Thursday, June 11th, 2020. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. Prepare for the unexpected in your business with LastPass. Trusted by over 17 million users and 61,000 businesses worldwide. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help you. And by ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN is an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers so your ISP can't see the sites you visit. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash TNW. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and a break in the tech news. I am Micah Sargent. And I'm Jason Howell. I'm not listening <laughs> to the song anymore, but before the show, we were listening to a remix of the Skype ringtone, and it's kind of like a dance remix, and I think I've got the tempo locked at about 122 yes. beats per minute. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to see if I can do the whole show bobbing my head. Oh, golly. Really. That might be not really. that might be a lot. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. Uh, the genre is dance. Um, I don't see – they didn't include the tempo in it, uh, unfortunately, but it's by – oh, wait. Do I have the tempo here? No. I've got the bit rate and the sample rate. <laughs> uh, but no but BPM. I don't have. No BPM. Uh, no Sorry. lyrics. Uh, but yeah. Sorry, just go to the club. You'll hear it. It's it's all the rage for the last seven years. It should it's all be. Good. Uh, look up <laughs> Skype song by Moodcraft and you will find the song that we're talking about. Maybe we'll even include a link in the show notes. But uh, it's, hey, it's a very good idea. Very good little song that I've been jamming out to this morning. Um, but, you know, let's uh, kick things off with our stories of the week. That's right. We like let's to keep you guessing. And this week we are starting with our stories of the week. Um, I saw this fly by, I think it was early this morning, actually, as I was kind of looking through. And it was something that made me a little bit sad. Um Apple has sort of softly announced <laughs> that it is discontinuing uh, iTunes U and iBooks Author. And so if you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, let's start there. iTunes U is iTunes University, and it is a platform where different uh, educators have been able to publish courses uh, in different different types of of, of educational subjects. And so uh, there are some pretty famous coding courses that have been available there, uh, different teaching courses where you can learn all a, a, any number of things. Um, and iTunes U has been an excellent resource uh, for both purchased and free courses that you could uh, take and learn all sorts of stuff. Um, iTunes U is going to be discontinued at the end of 2021. Uh, which, you know, that's a while from now, but it will eventually go away. And then iBooks Author was a way for, it, it's, an, it's an application and it's a sort of system wherein people can self-publish content. So I could go and make a book about uh, the history of Chihuahuas if I wanted to and publish it using iBooks Author, which then could be listed in the iBooks store. So it was a sort of 
process to both create and publish books. And I can remember a uh, former colleague, Serenity Caldwell, had taken advantage of iBooks author to create books and sort of was the go-to person for understanding how iBooks author worked. Well, unfortunately, that is going to be uh, unavailable as of July 1st of 2020, which of course is just around the corner. Um, now, with that said, uh, a good thing is that the Pages application, uh, which Apple has, you know, developed for quite some time and has made available to folks for free, now will have, uh, or actually, it already does have the ability to publish books using the Pages application. So Apple is encouraging folks to use that information with Pages, and a uh, an import tool is going to be added soon so that you can use Pages to edit those iBooks author books. As far as iTunes U, Apple says the publishers should move that content over to Apple Podcasts if it's an audio or video-based um, course or to Apple Books if it is a, you know, tech, tech or not tech, but text-based uh, course. So there are places for these things to go, but it does make my heart a little sad because uh, especially with, with iTunes U, less so with iBooks Author, it was one of the places that you could go and get some really good courses for free and learn a bunch. And so now it's going to be a little bit more difficult to say, okay, where do I go to find these courses to find this information now that iTunes author or excuse me, iTunes U is gone. Bit of a bummer. Yeah. Especially considering like if the solution is to move it over into the podcast directory, now you're dealing yeah. with a whole lot of podcasts to cycle through in order to find this. iTunes U launched initially in 2007, so it's been around for quite a while. I remember when it initially launched, people were pretty excited about it. I never used it personally, um, never never really ducked into that repository, but I, I definitely have known people who have loved it. So um, it's good that there's some sort of like transitional path though that this isn't just like we're gi we're giving up on you know as, as in the case of uh ibooks author we're giving up on you know authors and, and independent creators and stuff and i'm sorry like there's some sort of a path google with its switch from google play music to youtube music google play music used to and has had a kind of access point for independent musicians to add their music to the libraries and everything and have it distributed and accessible by people. And in the transition to YouTube music, that's going away entirely. Like there's no obvious way to do that in YouTube music, at least right now. So I'm happy that Apple is at least kind of paying attention to this and saying, hey, well, you, you were able to do this. Yes, we, we need to get rid of it for whatever reason, but we've created a path for it in another way. So it's still possible. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad. Yeah. I'm glad that that eventually will, you know, be available and that there is a way for people to go about it. But, um, I guess, you know, uh, I yeah. will miss you iTunes you and I will miss you less, but still miss you, uh, <laughs> to uh, iBooks author because I that part iBooks was author doesn't have to know that you'll miss it less. <laughs> That's true. Oh yeah. I'm sorry. I it's didn't really say that sad part. right now. Can you, beep that? Can you bleep that out for me? The part where I said less? No, I'm kidding. Uh, but sayonara to both of you, I guess. <laughs> Tell us about uh, your story of the week. Yeah, well, not quite as fun, but probably not as much laughter. Um, facial recognition. Isn't that hilarious? No. Um, there were a few <laughs> stories that caught my eye uh, this morning in the world of facial recognition. One of them you've probably already heard of. Uh, if you've been checking the tech news uh, this morning, you saw Amazon said yesterday they're going to ban police use of its facial recognition technology. That technology, by the way, if you didn't know, is called recognition. However, the C in recognition is replaced with a K, which to me just kind of feels wrong, especially when it's used in like, yeah. in, like attracting people perspective. It kind of has a certain undertone to it, whether you want to read into it or not. Uh, it's always given me that, that sort of vibe. So I've never liked the name. Um, anyways, Amazon is, is putting this on a one year moratorium to police, uh, departments. Amazon says it's advocating congressional oversight to put in stronger regulations around facial recognition. They hope that this year is going to give Congress the time needed to do that. Of course, the flip side of that is, well, what if that doesn't happen? Although there is some movement, so there there's some promise in in that hope. Um, 
to date, recognition has been used by a number of police departments, uh, though Amazon has refused to name which ones. They probably have some sort of an agreement with the police departments as far as that's concerned. Um, and this really does nothing, you know, to uh, affect Amazon's relationship with police departments as relates to its other hardware product, Ring, <laughs> which, as we've heard in, in the many months, you know, recently, uh, they have a they definitely have a, an arrangement with the police and you have to opt into it if you're a ring owner. But still, it's it's makes a lot of people uneasy that those ring video doorbells, you know, the, the footage from that can be easily tapped into by police and and uh, and monitored. So Amazon's relationship with police department right now, especially in this moment where all of this is so top of mind and so critical and important, um, things are shifting a little bit. And might just be part of the kind of the wider attention being placed to uh, police department reform and that sort of stuff. So um, I think that's good news. Although a year, you know, there's a lot of people criticizing Amazon. Like, why do you stop there? Why why should they have access mm -hmm. to this? I don't know. What do you think? That That's how I feel about it. I don't understand this year thing as if that's supposed yeah. to make it somehow. But I, I don't – what – what does a year do? Um, <laughs> I, it, it it's like they like can't commit. Gesture. They can't commit. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, exactly. They're saying, for now, we're not going to let them have this, but eventually we will. And what that what it says to me more than anything else is, we think that the calls for reform will be, uh, will have blown over in a year. And so at that mm -hmm. point, then we'll make it available to the police. That's what that says to me. So it feels... <laughs> It almost feels worse um, than yeah. having not done it at all because the gesture feels empty or it's it's not even that it feels empty. I, I don't know what th – there's like full, there's empty and then whatever is below empty, <laughs> that's it, – it feels negative uh, because it's saying – uh, we're just going to wait for this to blow over, but we're going to do this thing now because maybe it looks like it's a nice thing. Right. Uh, I, it satisfies I don't the like calls it. at this point. Yeah, exactly. totally. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, it's like uh, having your cake and eating it too, essentially, is what it mm -hmm. kind of is. Uh, IBM also said this week they're getting rid of uh, – they're getting out of the facial recognition business. Um, so there's, there's movement. Uh, I, I guess the positive is that these companies are – taking a look at this and second guessing their own kind of commitment to the technology that they've made and, uh, you know, possibly, hopefully crossing fingers, seeing how it could be used in bad ways, uh, as opposed to the ways that they think, you know, that they're super ambitious with what, what facial recognition could lead to. Sometimes the negative aspects of it get lost in the crossfire. Um, one other story real quick before we jump to the ad, one zero is Dave Gershgorn and friend of the show, uh, wrote about a facial recognition test that was run on 30,000 Rose Bowl attendees. No one in the stadium, this was early, earlier this year in January, no one in the stadium <laughs> <laughs> Certainly wasn't last month. Uh, no one was notified of the test. Uh, no consent, no awareness. Cameras were essentially hidden underneath digital signs. And they analyzed how long fans were looking at ads, uh, their gender, age, uh, and looking for suspicious persons, all that kind of stuff without being notified, right? Which really kind of uh, shows how like the, the biggies in this field, um, Amazon, IBM, you know, uh, Clearview, they can they do this and they fall under scrutiny because they gain that attention. But then you've got all these little smaller ad tech firms that also have access to this technology and they can really just kind of go rogue with it. And <laughs> whatever, we'll see what happens. Who cares? 30,000 people. It doesn't matter. And uh, here we are. <laughs> if it was if it was appropriate and uh, made for good audio, this is the part where I would just scream beep, for like seven beep, seconds. Beep, beep, um, beep. <laughs> but yeah, I guess I'll I'll let that go. It's uh that's just so stinking frustrating that yeah. they just okay, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna just do this thing and not tell anybody about it. That's yeah. awful. Awful. Not a good not a good time to do that now or really ever. So hopefully yeah. hopefully that yeah. message is driven home more and more as stories like these come out and they're discovered and everything. It's like, okay, well, wait a minute, maybe that wasn't a good idea. But they have no real reason to feel like it's not a good idea because the regulation is in place anyways. There's no real kind of uh, regulatory body that's holding their feet to the fire as far as this is concerned. So that seems to be where we are hopefully heading. Yep. You've said it perfectly.
<sighs> well, all right, get that technique. smile back on your face. <laughs> oh, I got to listen to my song. That'll be good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, exactly. Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Google has released the Android 11 beta. But before we get to that, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by LastPass. Listen, it's always important to have a plan for the unexpected. LastPass can be deployed quickly in the midst of any event to ensure your business keeps running smoothly and every employee login is secure. Single sign-on manages employee access in a centralized view, so IT always has insight into who has access to what from where. Enterprise password management ensures oversight of shadow IT and enforceable policies across all password-protected accounts. Multi-factor authentication requires additional factors to prove a user's identity, while the use of biometric and contextual factors makes the process smooth for employees. Businesses should be thinking about additional layers of defense beyond the password. LastPass does not send or store the master password. If LastPass can't access your data, hackers can't either. Encryption happens exclusively at the device level before syncing to LastPass for safe storage, so only users can decrypt their data. They use 256-bit AES encryption that is the same encryption type utilized by banks and the military. LastPass protects while providing a seamless workflow for your employees. Account access and passwords can be shared securely between employees, whether they're in the office or remote. Employees will get secure access to their work applications with single sign-on and password management, and there's an offline mode for both password management and multi-factor authentication so employees can always access what they need. Now, of course, we use LastPass here at Twit, uh, both on a personal and professional level. Uh, it makes it so simple so that, you know, whenever I join the company, I got uh, a LastPass account as part of the company and I'm able to gain access to the different accounts that we use. And it was so stinking simple to be able to access the sites I needed to. LastPass can help make remote work simple and secure. You just visit lastpass.com slash twit to find out how they can help your business stay productive and secure no matter what. Once again, that's lastpass.com slash twit. And our thanks to LastPass for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. We do appreciate you. Thank you, LastPass. All right. Google had such plans for this year, especially for Android 11 Beta 1. First, they planned to showcase it at Google I.O., but that was canceled because of COVID-19. Uh, then Google planned a live stream to unveil the new beta release. That was canceled, of course, due to the recent kind of surge of civil rights activism that's taking place nationwide. And finally, Google just went ahead and relented and just put up a blog post and released it yesterday because they're like, we we just can't win here. It's, it's just not working, <laughs> so let's just get it out. Uh, that's not to say that Google isn't excited, of course. Joining us to talk about what we, we can get excited about uh, in Android 11 is Daniel from Android Central. Welcome back to the show, Daniel. Hey, guys. How are you? Awesome. Peach it's good to see you, man. See uh, you. Great to get you on today. Thank you for taking some time with us. So um, I guess, I mean, since this is the new, the new beta, we should probably start with features. There are changes that focus on conversations, a few different changes. There's like conversations and then there's bubbles. But let's start with conversations. Why why were these changes, and it looks like, like I just installed this uh, yesterday afternoon, so I'm very new to like really living with these features as are most people, but why are these changes needed in the notification shade? Was it just too confusing before? <laughs> yeah, I think Google had been <clears throat> experimenting largely success successfully with uh, annual changes to notifications, right? I think there's yeah. a well-accepted trope that Android does notifications, if not better than iOS, then uh, the fact that they're a bit more delineated and granular and, and editable and all that stuff makes it more powerful. And as a result, um, you know, just the number of ways that applications were able to notify you was was becoming overwhelming. And I think what was apparent, especially right now, um, during, you know, COVID time where everybody's at home and they're using all of these different chat services, uh, there's, there needs to be a way to prevent no, uh, chat notifications from apps like, um, you know, Telegram and, and Facebook Messenger from getting just jumbled in with every other notification in your app in, in the notification shade. So this conversations view is always going to live on top of those other app 
notifications. They will allow you to prioritize particular people. One thing I really love about it is that you can prioritize a person in a particular app and they will, their little face will show up in the notification shade. It's really Mm -hmm. adorable. You know, all of these things speaks to the fact that Google understands how people are using their Android phones and increasingly it's as a form of communication uh, via text. And and that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, now, along this this line, you know, of, of conversations and messaging and everything is, you know, one of the major features that Google seems to be touting right now is the inclusion of bubbles, which anyone who's been on Android <laughs> for any number of years would say that, wait a minute, have bubbles been around for like literally years? Uh, why why is Google now giving it kind of like the official treatment saying, okay, we've integrated it now. Is there so much demand for bubbles that finally they had to give in? Or it just seems like a strange time to like buckle down on bubbles. <laughs> I agree. Uh, I, I don't really have an answer for you there, Jason, other yeah. than to say this feels like something Google had been wanting to add as an official API for many years. Uh, We knew that bubbles were soft launched in Android 10 beta, and then the release was, the API was pushed past that launch. I guess they didn't get it right. Google has been finding ways of making overlays safe. So this idea of app developers building overlays on top of the screen so that you can manipulate, say, a picture in picture view They've been trying to clamp down on developers that don't use these um, features in a consistent way. And bubbles were really up there with those kinds of features that if if abused could potentially lead to malware and lead to uh, a bad user experience. And the bubbles API, it, it re- kind of replaces the need for a company like Facebook who has been using chat bubbles forever to build their own private API to to upgrade them as Android versions change. And I think this just allows Google to say, hey, if you're going to use this, just do it our way, do it consistently so that people have a consistent experience. Obviously, Google itself has been using bubbles in the in the phone app for a while now. If you minimize a phone call, for instance, it will become a bubble on your home screen and you can move it around. So Google basically took that idea and just made it a public API that any developer could tap into for a particular uh, messaging service. And look, I don't think it's going to make big, it's not going to make any major changes to the way that people use their phones, but it's, it's kind of a nice to have, and it works well with the conversations view. Yeah. Uh, So so bubbles, all very exciting. Um, And I hate to burst them, but let's move on to something that has me excited. (laughs) Uh, Mm -hmm. is the smart home controls. By goodness, by golly, um, it's something that I have enjoyed on iOS for a long time and something that when using an Android device, you know, you go into the Google Home app to do most of the smart home control, but it feels more baked in now as of this Android 11 beta. So could you talk a little bit about that and how this works separate from that Google Home app? So... I knew that you would be excited about this because you were one of the first people in my life to be excited about just like smart home controls in general and consolidation, uh, home kit, you know, you, I, I, I remember your excitement when, when the home app debuted on iOS, I (laughs) think this is kind of that, I think this is Google acknowledging that people don't really go into the home app all that much, especially to manipulate various toggles and that if you're going to offer people an experience that's better than going into your Nest app and then your, uh, then your Philips Hue app and then your, you know, <laughs> then your, you know, whatever other smart home service apps separately to manipulate all of these controls, you're going to want to put it in a place that is accessible. And the home screen, the, 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 the power menu rather is totally accessible and it makes sense. And what's really interesting about this is that it's tapping into Google play services And all this is, is just a front end for your home app. So it's basically allowing Google to say, okay, the home app recognizes all of these different smart home accessories from lights to thermostats to everything. And we're just going to give you another place to make these toggles work. Because if you actually tap on one of these buttons, it is 
the UI is identical to what you'd find in the home app. So I'm guessing Google didn't really have to work that hard. It's just like, here's a different front for all of these features that already exist. Yeah, and I have it on my my screen right now. Hey, I probably can't see it uh, very easily, but down, I, it, basically you hold down the power button and along with the power features, you also get this bottom row configurable of uh, smart home controls. And I love it because I'm I'm every day I have to jump into either the home app or, you know, I've, I've put a widget on my home screen to do certain things because that was a little bit easier. I'm so much happier with this like totally integrated uh, solution as far as that's concerned. Um, right before showtime, I just saw that Android 11 actually breaks Android Pay. Obviously, that's not a feature. That won't be in the final release. But is that the case right now? Like, but basically, if you uh, if you don't have to install Android 11, like for people who are curious about just running Android 11 on their their daily driver, this would be a pretty big reason not to. Would you agree? Yeah, I don't think people should install this anyway. Even if it's on, like, if you have a secondary phone, a Pixel, and it works, and you don't need it for um, for your life or your job. I wouldn't install this yet. It's pretty buggy overall. Google, it breaking Google Pay is weird because it actually passes Safety Net. Uh, safety Net is that feature. Like the Google basically requires manufacturers when they update their phones, it has to go through a certification process, and all of those security, um, you know, bits and bobs have to have to be valid. They can't, you know, make it rootable, for instance, if you update a phone and, and uh, if they find any, you know, show stopping bugs or, or vulnerabilities, they will it will fail safety net and you won't be able to use your banking app or Google Pay. Uh, this passes safety net. But for some reason, Google Pay just isn't working for many people. But we did an internal survey and Google Pay is working for like half of the people on the AC staff that work that that run uh, Android 11. So I don't really know if it's a completely like ubiquitous problem or if it's just for some people. Yeah, I, I really don't know. Yeah, I'll have to test it out. I've definitely been using Google Pay. I said Android Pay. It's Google's legacy it of, of changing <laughs> their names years. every two months. Yes, exactly. What about Big uh, I give it a year before it goes back to Android Pay and then it becomes something else like no. Google Meet Pay, because why not? Let's just, let's just <laughs> the only everything. thing they haven't done yet is Android Wallet. They did Google Wallet, then they did it, <laughs> and, you know, Android Pay, then now that Google Pay, and they'll go back to Android Wallet. And we'll, oh God, you know, don't tell I don't me. know what you call that. Um, so then, all right, buggy for everyday users. That's good to know. Um, as we, because this is kind of like closer uh, of a view of what Android 11 actually has in store. I was uh, surfing around the other day and I, I ran across the launch video for the Galaxy Nexus and I watched it and I, I remembered how exciting those those like promotional videos for the new version of Android, the new big phone that's kind of like the launch phone for the new version of Android, how exciting those were back in the day because there was so much innovation that hadn't happened yet. There was like a, an endless pool of things that they could do to make phones cooler. How does Google take Android 11 and really just future device uh, OS releases right now in this current paradigm, how do they take these things and make them exciting for consumers? Or are we kind of beyond that? Our phones are just our phones and it's hard to get excited about this stuff. I will, I'll get, I'll, I'll say two things about this. So back in the day, you know, it, like any Android site, Android central would just go whole hog on Android releases, right? From the first developer preview through the beta, through the final and, you know, Android, um, Android 6, Android 7, Android 8, those would all be insane traffic days for us, like best of the year kind of days. Yeah. Um, that is not the case anymore. So Android 11, um, and, and started with Android 9 Pi and Android 10, especially with Android 10, we just noticed that the interest levels are not there anymore. And I think it's because of a couple of things. First, that when a company like Samsung brands Android, a new version, it's their own brand, right? Samsung does not advertise an Android 10 update. They advertise a One UI 2.0 update. One, uh, OnePlus does the Oxygen OS whatever mm -hmm. update. And those are separate things to what Google is doing with this public release of Android. And the second thing is exactly what you mentioned, that there just aren't that many show-stopping features. This is a mature operating system. It's been like that for a while, and it doesn't feel like anything major is missing. 
in the way that it used to around, you know, 2011, Google was still building in features that iOS had had for a while. And it felt like it was, they were trying to leapfrog one another every year. Uh, that's why Google IO was so exciting because you would be like, oh, this year they're adding in, um, you know, smart notifications or like actionable notifications and things like that. Now you take it for granted that you, anything you want to do on a mobile phone, you can do. I think one thing that I've heard again and again is that Google is really still focusing on the phone, not so much on tablets and Chrome and Android is everywhere. And it's still a big deal on those two platforms, even though the, the sheer scale is, is less and things like, you know, a desktop mode or freeform window mode, they don't feel like Google is really investing the time into making those, um, top tier features. And I, I, I think that's really what it comes down to is that in the future, will Google put in the effort to make Android a, a first class citizen on things that aren't glowing rectangles that fit in your pocket? Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Well, I'm happy that I have it installed, although I do, I am doing the thing where I have it installed on my main phone. It's usually what I do every year though. So I can at least, um, I can excuse it for that. So I'm expecting bugs and everything, but I want to get a sense of it. And I appreciate your time, Daniel, kind of walking us through some of these features uh, to let us know what to look for, look, look out for. Uh, AndroidCentral.com. If people want to follow you online, where can they do so? Uh, you can find me uh, on Twitter at JourneyDan. And uh, yeah, that's that's basically all I do is I just tweet bad hot takes. Um, <laughs> and uh, thanks so much for having me. It's always a pleasure being here. Right on, man. We'll talk to you soon, Daniel. Take care of yourself. Okay. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Mike. Right. Bye. See you later. All right. Up next, uh, it's so easy to take uh, to take today's tech for granted. Uh, Brian Cooley from CNET joins to talk about that. Also, CNET's 25-year anniversary. Kind of crazy. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Uh, there are a whole lot of reasons that you need to be running a VPN. The, the one that comes to mind is the one that's maybe least applicable to this moment in time. You go to a coffee shop, you hop on public Wi-Fi, uh, you're doing searching or you're buying something. A lot of that data can be transmitted out in the open on open Wi-Fi networks. And a VPN is kind of designed to help with that and so much more, even, even designed to just be running in your home on your machine so that your ISP doesn't know every single little thing that you're doing online. That's what a VPN is, is really good about. Uh, most of you are probably thinking, uh, you know, outside of a VPN, that incognito mode might be good enough, but incognito mode does not hide your activity. It doesn't matter what mode you use or how many times you clear your browsing history, your ISP, your internet service provider can still see every single website that you've ever visited. It's just not stored on your device. That's all you're really doing there. Uh, that's why even when I'm home, I don't go online without using ExpressVPN. It doesn't matter if you get your internet from Verizon or Comcast, or any other local ISP, ISPs in the U.S. can legally sell your information to ad companies. We talk about that on this show all the time, so uh, your ears probably perked up a little bit there. ExpressVPN is an app that reroutes your internet connection through their secure servers, and that's so your ISP can't see the sites that you visit. ExpressVPN also keeps all of your information secure by encrypting 100% of your data with the most powerful encryption available. Now, most of the time, uh, you won't even realize that you have Ex ExpressVPN running, right? Like, I remember the days where VPN would really slow things down. That's just not the case with ExpressVPN. It runs seamlessly in the background. It's so easy to use. All you have to do is tap one button and you're protected. ExpressVPN is available on all your devices, so your phones, computers, even your smart TV, so there's no excuse for you to not be using it. Protect your online activity today with a VPN rated number one by CNET and Wired, and visit our exclusive link, expressvpn.com slash TNW, and you can get an extra three months free on a one-year package expressvpn.com slash TNW to get that deal. expressvpn.com slash TNW. And you can learn more. And we thank ExpressVPN for their support of this show. Tech enthusiasts like myself would have you believe that all of the technology that we have today is inevitable. But that's a 
bit of a, a misnomer, a mistake, uh, uh, an idea that isn't necessarily true. In fact, the phones that we use today, these smartphones with all of their various uh, applications, they almost didn't happen which is a bit of a shock, I'm sure. Uh, joining us today to talk about uh, the lack of inevitability of the tech that we have today uh, is CNET's Brian Cooley. Hello, Brian. Hey, Micah. Hey, Jason. How you guys doing? We awesome. are That's doing well. Thank you for being here to talk to us about this. Um, you know, one of the, the main things that you talk about in this article is device convergence. And that is that phrase alone takes me back to the <laughs> keynote presentation of of a certain uh, Mr. Jobs who who was trying to talk about the iPhone as this device that was an internet browser, a, an iPod, and a phone uh, that we all kind of thought, oh, is it three devices? No, it's one device that does all of these things. Um, but there was a period of time where experts didn't quite think that we would have a device that served as a phone, that served as an internet browser, and that served mm -hmm. as uh, a music listening device. So can you talk about sort of where we started and at that point, why uh, people didn't see the smartphone as being a thing that would eventually come to be? You know, a lot of this, let me read you a couple of quotes from uh, old CNET articles that were fascinating to me as I was as I was reading this. You probably saw them, but for the audience, uh, one CNET writer wrote back in the early 2000s, do we really want our phones to do everything? Another article said, <laughs> Convergence devices scare me. And these, are, <laughs> these are smart technology reporters and editors. So it tells us about what the time was like back then. And so many things had been tried, like the Newton, like General Magic's Magic Cap devices from Sony and AT&T, um, like uh, you know any number of devices, even Blackberries. They were pretty. They were pretty simple. They didn't do a whole lot except messaging for a long time. We tried to converge. They didn't work. Pocket PCs, the early efforts to put a, a Windows computer in your pocket, pretty much all of those were a disaster until Oof, yeah. the last wave, you know, that was on the Metro interface. And so we had a lot of, I think, uh, gun shyness about it saying, you know, we've all tried convergence as different companies and software visionaries, and it just doesn't work. You're looking at a bunch of the ones that failed right there. I mean, no one remembers the Pocket PC, the Magic Cap devices, the Apple Newton, and yet they were so close to the right formula but something had to click, and it's a good lesson, I think, that we need to keep trying at things, whether it's AR and VR that are coming, whether it's connected health and getting more wearables on us that are like a, a roving, uh, you know, ICU worth of sensors. Whatever it is, we got to keep trying because we're closer than we think a lot of time, even when it seems like, no, it's not going to work. Yeah, so I, I do have to take a second because as I was uh, going through this article, looking at the the different devices that uh, are mentioned here, I know about Pocket PC, I know about the Apple Newton, but just as a person who's interested in technology, I was surprised that I had never heard of Magic Cap and the the oh. Sony Magic Link. Can we talk for a second about that? Because that more than maybe the other two seemed like the the real beginning of of what we would eventually have. I mean, it, it has the desktop interface. It has this um, sort of I want to work with all of these different devices, no matter what they happen to be and different communication platforms. Do you have a, just a little tidbit more about the, the Magic Cap and yeah. Magic Link? Yeah, General Magic's the most interesting story. A number of your Twit viewers will definitely know it. It's a company. You have to be of a certain age to know about it, though, uh, you know, because it was quite a while ago. We're talking about a late 90s company and uh, mid 90s, really. And it had an amazing roster of interesting, quirky and nonconformist engineers come together. And they really broke the mold and said, wait a minute, let's just rethink this whole idea of a PC sits on a desk at home or at work, and it does email and web, which even those were new or barely <laughs> available. And then a phone is a phone. You flip it open, you do calls, you flip it back close. Let's rethink how we bring that together and not just do a mashup because that's what some of the early devices did. They tried to make something existing smaller or just bolt mm -hmm. a couple of existing things together. And General Magic, with their Magic Cap platform, General Magic was the company, came along and said, let's just rethink it from the ground up. It was very Apple. It was a Skunk Works cousin of Apple. That's part of the reason it had so much good iPhone, iOS, DNA in it early on. 
Uh, it fell apart for various reasons, although they had partners making devices like Sony. Um, and it, it didn't work because of a lot of reasons that had to do with not getting it done on time. They tried to do perfect and didn't ship with good instead and keep working toward perfect. Uh, they also did not recognize the Internet, which was just coming at that moment, mid and late 90s. And they were trying to do things on a private network that AT&T, I think, was very much in favor of, as you can imagine. And <laughs> wireless data was really hard in those days. It, was, it really wasn't data. Everything was a modem that was using phone connectivity, just like the old modems did. So there were some things in their way, but it set the table, as you've noticed, as you, as you looked at it. There's a great movie out there right now that's called, I think just called General Magic, and we have a link to it in the story. It is such an interesting story in how this idea of convergence and refinement needs to be done as we're innovating with new products that maybe we haven't quite got dialed in yet. It's a very good lesson in what to pursue, how to pursue it, and what to leave behind as you try to get to market. Because getting to market and speaking to real people's needs is key. There's a million graves in Silicon Valley that are filled with entrepreneurs' ideas that didn't stick to real people's needs. So then let's talk about the bridge here. You know, we went from these devices that you, you mentioned, uh, sort of private network, private modem uh, system, and General Magic didn't quite make the cut. But there had to be some devices and some ideas that served as, uh, it, whether it be the jumping off point or sort of the bridge between those early devices and the true convergence of, of all of them that became, you know, the iPhone of today. And yeah. it seems to be Palm Pilot. Is that, is that what, what kind of was in between there? I'm such a huge booster of the Palm Pilot and really the trio that followed after it. And Handspring mm -hmm. and Palm. Uh, have this twisted kind of an in and out, uh, you know, siblings that came together into one family relationship. It's too complicated to get into. But the Palm Pilot brought this whole idea of a PDA together, a personal digital assistant. So I'd have my calendar, my notes, my to-do list. But it wasn't a connected device at all. The only connection it had was you would dock it at your computer, push one button, and it would sync to your Windows PC. I don't recall if it did Mac or not. And so you had a desktop version of the same stuff you had on your portable. That was a really big deal then. Now we think of that as silly today in terms of being <laughs> impressive. But then came the Trio. The Trio was such a big bang, and it was a real hit, sold in huge numbers for its era when it arrived. And it was the one that first brought together the idea of a phone, a web browser, email, and some degree of apps. And all of it built around an operating system and an interface that was built for that new idea not pulling Windows onto a little screen or yanking the Mac OS over to a small screen. So it was a, I think it's an undersung hero. It's not forgotten, but I think a lot of folks say, oh, it all started with the iPhone. I don't think it's that simple. The, the trio had a huge amount to do with getting us teed up for the era, the iPhone, of course, turbocharged. Uh in reading through your your piece and just kind of like seeing how long this arc really was in retrospect, it's, it's truly kind of like, you know, proves the hindsight is twenty twenty sort of thing. Um, it, it kind of occurs to me that I feel sometimes like now in this kind of modern technology era, we don't have as much patience as we used to for a true convergence or, or that arc to, to kind of play out. Would you, do you think that's a fair, a fair assessment? Like, I feel like over the course of that long, we had to go through, we had to tread through a lot of mud in order to get something that finally, you know, find the gold at the end of the path. Um, are, are we, are we patient enough for that now with, with like current technologies that could, could need to develop out? Like AR is one example that you point out, but what do you think? Uh, yeah, augmented reality and connected health seem to be the two places, uh, at least that I think, have the potential to blow up next to take a convergence ethic and then really find a role in a lot of people's lives. Uh, and you can you can look at both of those, especially AR, and you can see a lot of impatience now. But I also would say AR has been coming for a long time. So I don't know that we're out of patience because our patience was short with AR. We're out of patience because AR has been around for a long time, promising us that it's just about to become widely relevant. And it has <laughs> not done that yet. Uh, we get it, but we're doing a show about tech. Uh, we are in the 1% of people who are really tech forward and look at things and dig deeply and say, okay, the potential's there. But you cannot ask people to get their pick and shovel out and go dig around and unearth the potential in a technology. It's got to be sitting on the surface. It, the, the, the device has to be, in, in, in essence, plated 
chrome plated or gold plated with its with its promise and its value. You can't make them go dig for it. And so I think that's where AR has to find a way to converge with both the devices it'll be best at, probably phone, probably not glasses for the time being, uh, has to uh, converge with real appetites that we have right now and has to converge with the kinds of data streams that are available. And then another direction has to converge with coming 5G. Another form of convergence, you pull those four poles together and you start to see where AR can finally break out and say, ah, got it. People will look at it, they'll get the value immediately, and they won't have to twist and contort themselves to get that value. Whenever you ask people to twist and consort, contort and jump through hoops to get the value out of a technology, forget it. You've just made yourself mm -hmm. a 5% market share tech. Yeah. So uh, another area that you talk about in the article, you've got AR, but also health. And yeah. health is is huge. I mean, we continue to see every single time a, a big uh, hardware manufacturer or software creator uh, is introducing a new version, a new update, a new uh, device it adds more and more health features. And something that's very big right now, of course, is uh, the pandemic that we're all dealing with. And yeah. with that comes contact tracing. Uh, and you mentioned something that I found very interesting. I ended up going and looking at it. And it's the Happen app, uh, yeah. which can, can you talk a little bit about the, the Happen app and sort of the way that now health uh, could have a convergence breakthrough? Yeah, so Happen, H-A-P-P-N, is an app that is essentially contact tracing, but not for health. It was designed to connect with people who you may have passed by or, as it says, crossed paths with. It's kind of some four-square DNA. Do people still do four-square? I don't honestly know. <laughs> Yeah, so it's fair with some GPS, uh, with some modern COVID contact tracing kind of put together. But what's so interesting about it is it's something that's of value to you personally, whereas today's COVID contact tracing we know is of value to us as a society. We need to opt into it unless you disagree with it. I'm not saying you have to, but it's a social benefit to allow yourself to be traced, whereas something like Happen is a selfish benefit. Uh, as are most things that have been a big hit in the connected world. Uh, that's just the way it is. If we can serve people's selfish needs, they go all over it. I mean, you, you think people are using Facebook and social media primarily for news or using it primarily to feed their own personal interests, maybe to hear what they already thought is true, maybe to find friends that they've lost since high school. It's all kind of very personal satisfaction. Uh, I think that's the kind of thing that when you – when you can wrap up a core technology in that candy coating that makes us want to consume it, but there's also a societal benefit we can extract from it, uh, that's where things have to go. I was just talking to one of the lead researchers over at eMarketer this morning. They just, did a, they just did a big report on data privacy in the age of COVID-19. And you know that contact tracing is not going to go away. We've all gotten used to it now. But going forward, brands, technology companies, and others are going to say, let's not let this go. Let's find a way to keep people reporting their contacts because it is good long-term for health. There, this is not the last communicable disease respiratorily that we're going to see. We know that. Maybe even waves of this particular one. And we can give them better services as well as create companies around that contact information, something that wasn't terribly readily available before. So you're going to see contact tracing be, uh, be worked down really hard by companies that want to candy coat it and keep you doing it. That's the big takeaway. It, we got started with COVID-19 ethic around it, but they're going to try and dip it in chocolate and keep us uh, doing it for a long time. <laughs> dip it in chocolate. I like that. Uh, in your I'll article too, you dip in chocolate, right? <laughs> exactly. So uh, you you also uh, quote a uh, tech industry exec and advisor. Is it Steve Tobak? Tobak? Yeah. Um, yeah. Who says that the recipe for convergent success is having intellectual con uh, capital, content, and great marketing? That those three things have to come together to uh, result in a, in a success for convergence. And so those are things that you do think could happen for AR and for health or that maybe are happening right now? Absolutely. And I want to, uh, I'm, I want to remember when, uh, yeah, 08 was that article by, uh, that where we quoted Steve Toback, where he wrote a column for us. So we're going back, you know, not a huge number of years at this point, early iPhone era, right? Um, mm -hmm. The things he points out there, that idea of great marketing, Tony Fidel also echoes that, I think a little bit in the piece. And when he and I talked, Tony was the guy that did most of the engineering on the iPod, a ton of engineering on iPhone. He founded Nest. 
And now he's over at Future Shape, which is a, an advisory and a VC firm. Um, he's, you know, he's a visionary around this kind of stuff, around new converged devices. And all of these people have the same echo that if you're developing it and you don't have the marketing being developed at the same time, you're going to have a hard road to go. Uh, and that may sound kind of crass to a lot of people that are pure technologists, really skilled engineers, whatever they may be. They say, let us do our thing and we'll build a beautiful thing. And of course, they're going to want it. Look how well it works. Look what breakthroughs it has. But you've got to shape it, they will tell you, as you move along through the lens of how you're going to market it. Uh, and that's, you know, that, that can be one that people will push back on in the technology community because they see the marketing as something that often waters down great products that will divert or dilute them. But sometimes a little of that dilution is to try and get a huge market with a product that maybe isn't quite as technically impressive as it could have been. But you got a huge market, which allows you to develop, develop, develop many more versions with a lot of money coming in to get to that best possible product down the road. All right. Well, uh, Brian Cooley, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and for this oh, excellent yeah, article. Nice talking to you. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody needs to go check out this piece and uh, all the great links that are a part of it as well. I'm uh, holding down command and clicking <laughs> on so many of them. I've got so many tabs open from this article. Uh, so lot, thank you. It took a lot of digging to find some of those photos. Some of those products I haven't seen or thought about in about 20 years. Uh, everyone has to go to <laughs> IPAC with a backpack. This is my favorite photo in there. Uh, and it shows the horsiest possible convergence ever where you take a, you know, a, a, a portable and a, a pretty simple PDA and then you clip a camera onto the back of it. It's like, oh, you're killing me. But that's all we could do in those days. So it's a yeah. great walk through history, especially if you're under 30. You haven't seen some of these products. And I think it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting look at how uh, relatively recently – we seemed to be a long way from the goal line. And then all of a sudden we got there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, as one of those under 30s, I was very impressed with some of this stuff. Um, if, if folks want to follow you online and check out your work, where do they go to do that? Oh, best thing to do is just go to uh, just, just go to CNET. My stuff's all through there, um, and uh, there's uh, I've got a profile page on there somewhere with my stuff. My automotive stuff is the easiest to find. That's Cooley on Cars. Dot com c o o l e y on cars dot com that's my whole cars and technology section within CNET's Roadshow, which is our automotive site. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, today. guys. Have fun. Thank Stay you, well. Brian. It's a pleasure. Happy twenty five years of CNET. Thanks, Jason. Glad <laughs> you were part of it. <laughs> Thank you, man. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Yeah, Brian's awesome. I love I loved working with that guy. Uh, we've reached the end of this episode of Tech News Weekly. Not quite 25 years yet, but uh, <laughs> we'll go One a little day. bit further down the road and we'll we'll look back on this 25 years from now. And we'll see uh, see what we think. T uh, Tech News Weekly publishes every Thursday at twit.tv slash TNW. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's the place where you can go, the show page, uh, where we have all the ways to subscribe to the show, audio, video formats, links out to YouTube, if that's your jam. Uh, whatever the case may be, subscribe to the show so you don't miss a single episode. Don't forget to follow Micah on social media at Twitter, uh, on Twitter at Micah Sargent. Also, hands on iOS, twit.tv slash HOI. Today's episode is all about health records. Thank you, Micah. I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. You can find Hands on Android at twit.tv slash HOA. And uh, today I have an episode that published that's all about uh, exploring. It's like an experiment with Android uh, 10's hidden desktop mode. So if you're curious about that, what it can do, and really what you realize is it can't do a whole lot, go to twit.tv slash HOA and you'll find out along with me. Thanks to everyone who helps us do this show each and every week. Thank you, John. Thank you, Burke and the studio. And thanks to you for watching and listening. We'll see you next time on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Be sure to check out the other shows on the network, like my other show, Hands On Wellness. I love to share different tips and tricks that's going to help you get a better grasp on your personal wellness. Just go to twit.tv slash how and subscribe now.